All right, hello, my name is James DeBizer. I'm a senior manager and senior scientist at the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And I'm here to talk to you about a few of the more interesting recent results from SOFIA. There we go. So what is SOFIA? It's an observatory built out of a heavily modified Boeing 747 aircraft. And mounted inside this aircraft is a 2.5 meter diameter telescope that's optimized for performing science in the far infrared. So you might ask why build an observatory out of an aircraft? Well, we see here that there's a large swath of wavelength space from about 25 to 350 microns, where light does not make it to ground-based observatories. Now I'll refer to this wavelength range roughly as the far infrared. SOFIA flies in the stratosphere. And that's high enough to get it above 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere's infrared absorbing water vapor. And that allows it to observe a very broad wavelength range that entirely encompasses the far infrared. Of course, infrared satellite observatories like JWST, Spitzer, Herschel, these are ways of getting around these atmospheric issues. However, unlike SOFIA, these facilities cannot be fixed once they're launched into space. Uh, they can't be upgraded either. So the ability for SOFIA to constantly update and upgrade its instrumentation can keep it at the cutting edge of science. SOFIA can do a wide variety of science, and in this brief talk, I will discuss three of the more recent and exciting scientific results that demonstrate the fantastic science that SOFIA does, and in so doing, I'll touch on some of SOFIA's capabilities. I'll first begin by talking about the SOFIA Galactic Sender Legacy Survey and tell you about some of the first results, as well as opportunities available to you to use those data yourself. This is an image of our inner galaxy, and it's the highest resolution infrared map yet achieved at wavelengths beyond 20 microns. This Spitzer space satellite image shows a tremendous amount of detail, but it is oversaturated and shows a fair amount of saturation in the brightest and most interesting areas seen here in white. Now, SOFIA has no saturation issues, and as part of a legacy project, we revisited these areas concentrating on those that were saturated in the Spitzer 24 and 7 micron images. And here we see the SOFIA data, which now reveals the beautiful and complex structures that were previously hidden in these areas at these wavelengths. Several regions, seen here in red, have already been the subject of study by the legacy group and their pilot studies. However, there's a lot more to explore here. And since these SOFIA data were taken as part of a legacy project, the data are available right now for anyone to download and analyze. So if you're interested, please go to the URSA archive at IPAC. So let's get back to the galactic center data. Combining these SOFIA data that you see here with Herschel 70 micron data and overlaying an unsaturated near infrared star system Spitzer reveals this beautiful composite look at our inner galaxy. And I think this single image provides a simple but profound visual demonstration of the powerful synergies that are possible when SOFIA data is combined with data from other wavelengths, like those from facilities, those facilities like Spitzer and Herschel. But now let's zoom into the environment close to our gal galaxy's central supermassive black hole. Within the inner few parsecs, we see what is known as the circumnuclear ring. These SOFIA data are the highest resolution observations of the far from emission from this ring ever taken. The ring structure is centered on and revolving around our galaxy's supermassive black hole, Sag J star. And we can see the bright infrared structures that are referred to as the mini spiral arms. And these appear to be structures that are funneling material towards the supermassive black hole. But proof that this is actually happening is beyond just morphological considerations. And that's why where data from an additional SOFIA instrument, a polarimeter named Hawk Plus, can help. Far infrared polarimeters like Hawk Plus have the ability to map out magnetic fields traced by dust grains uh, that align with those magnetic fields and emit and polarize light from the far infrared. And this allows us to visualize the magnetic fields in the galactic center like this. And now we see that the magnetic field lines do indeed lie along and trace the many spiral arms. And because it's easier for material to move along magnetic field lines rather than perpendicular to them, these data reinforce the idea that these arms are streams of material in highly eccentric orbits whose convergence point is not exactly the location of Sag J star. 
It's believed that material falling in towards the galactic center is being channeled by these magnetic fields into orbit around the supermassive black hole. Now, our galaxy center is rather quiescent for a galaxy the size of the Milky Way. And so it could perhaps be that the magnetic fields here are regulating the amount of material that falls onto our supermassive black hole. Next, I'll discuss uh, Sophia observations concerning the role of feedback from massive stars. Now, we're all likely familiar with the beautiful optical images of the Orion Nebula, like this one here. But in the mid infrared and far infrared, of course, we get a direct view of the structures that make up the nebula via their dust emission, like in the Spitzer 8 micron image. However, the dust here is intermixed with gas, and we can see great spatial correlations between the dust emission and ionized carbon gas emission, or C2 emission, as seen by Sophia's great instrument at 150 microns. And while the optical image, the Spitzer dust image, and these great gas images reveal similar looking structures, the, biz the biggest advantage of the Sophia data taken by GREAT is that it is taken in a way that also captures information about the velocity of the gas observed. And so here's an animation of the carbon-2 gas emission in Orion made by stepping through images that are generated increasing gas velocities along the line of sight to the Orion. And as this movie plays, one thing becomes clear when we look down to the south region in a region known as the Veil Bubble. The bubble is expanding. Now, interior to this bubble, and not seen in this data, lies a massive O star that can be seen in visible light named Theta 1c. And its strong stellar winds have swept up the material into the shell that we see as the Veil Bubble. So, this is all very neat and cool looking, but why are these data important? Well, they're important because they provide insight into the role of stellar feedback. Until recently, there was a consensus that supernova are the form of stellar, stellar feedback that are most responsible for destroying molecular clouds and galaxies. However, there are three more types of feedback, photoevaporation, photoionization, and stellar winds. These SOFIA results show that in this part of Orion, the feedback from stellar winds are much more dominant than the evaporation and ionization combined. In fact, from these data, we can estimate the rate of expansion of the shell, and we find it substantially faster than the escape velocity of the host molecular cloud. This means that the stellar wind bubble from Theta 1c will disrupt the molecular cloud to the point that by the time Theta 1c goes supernova, its molecular home will have already been destroyed. Hence, stellar winds will play a larger role in destroying this molecular cloud than even supernova will. Now, stellar feedback is such an important field of study. But Sophia is sponsoring a special session here at the AAS dedicated to talking about this very topic. It'll take place this afternoon in a little more than an hour from now, and I encourage you all to check out this session of talks if you're interested in this topic. Now, to wrap things up, I'll move on to one of our most recent and very exciting Sophia observations, and that's of the direct detection of water on the moon. So there's a desire to know if the moon has water if we're ever going to stay there someday. Obviously, water is required for us to live, but it's also very heavy. It would be extremely resource intensive and expensive to launch water to the moon to maintain a lunar base. So is there any water on the moon that we could potentially harvest? Well, it turns out that observations trying to detect water on the moon from ground-based astronomical observatories are not possible because the signal of the water in the Earth's own atmosphere literally drowns out the signal of water from celestial sources. So in order to try to see this signal, we have to get above the Earth's atmosphere. And the answer until recently has been to try to observe these potential signatures of lunar water from satellite missions. Several missions have observed the moon, including most successfully NASA's El Cross mission. Launched in 2009, it was designed to essentially bomb a permanently shadowed crater close to the south pole of the moon, and then observe the resultant debris plume and scan it for water. The result and along with some previous led to a strong case for the existence of water in the permanently shadowed craters in the lunar poles. Water, perhaps delivered by eons of cometary impacts, became trapped there as water ice, thanks to the unending darkness and cold temperatures. In fact, for a long time, it was believed that if the moon had any water at all, the only chance would be in these permanently shadowed. However, recent missions have found surprising and tantalizing evidence for the existence of water across the entire lunar surface, including more recently NASA's LRO mission, which was launched in the same payload as LCROSS in 2009. 
It contained multiple instruments for studying the lunar surface and was launched six months after the Chandrayaan-1 satellite, which was launched by India in 2008. It too was designed to map the entire surface of the moon with its m cubed instrument and look for minerals and water. The types of observations conduct conducted by both LRO and Chandrayaan-1, as well as some previous satellites, were only able to indirectly measure the possible presence of water through measurements of hydrogen as a proxy, and they could get that from UV measurements or from neutron detectors, or the presence of a spectral signature in the near infrared that can come from water, but can also come from hydroxyl, and it can also come from a mixture of the two. So from these proxy observations, we've been able to infer that water might exist all over the surface of the moon, but this conclusion is not based on observations of a signal directly from water, or from an unambiguous detection of the signal due to water alone. So here's an illustration of that spectral feature in the near infrared uh, that was being observed by LRO and Chandrayaan-1. And as you can see here, there's a spectral feature around three microns for both water and hydroxyl that's due to the stretching and bending, uh, the stretching vibrations uh, between oxygen and hydrogen bonds that exist in both hydroxyl and the water model. However, there exists a feature further out in the mid-infrared at six microns that's only due to the bending vibrations of the water molecule. But these previous missions that we discussed did not have the ability to observe this feature. And that leads us to the remarkable observations by Sophia. Since Sophia is an observatory that can uniquely fly high enough above the water in the Earth's atmosphere, unlike ground-based observatories, it can observe a clear spectral signature of water and celestial objects from its airborne platform. It also has an infrared instrument that can search for the signal of water in the mid-infrared at six microns. And this spectral feature, as I mentioned, is only due to the presence of water. So for this experiment, we observed the Clavius crater, which is at a low enough lunar latitude that it's not a permanently shadowed crater. And we were able to detect the first unambiguous signal of water on the sunlit surface of the moon with Sophia at six microns. In this plot here to the right, I show the data from the observations. And it shows the presence of this six micron water feature in six different slit sampling locations along the Clavius crater. Each slit sampling position corresponds to different colored data points on this spectral plot. And so we see here that this six micron water feature is present across all parts of the crater that we're sampling. Okay, so there's water here. How much water are we talking about? Well, the water is only believed to exist in a very thin surface layer of soil, but the abundance measured at six microns is equivalent to about 12 ounces of water per cubic meter of surface area. Uh, okay, you're gonna have to excuse this graphic. I've been informed that some people don't consider Dasani to actually be water. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when there was a run on toilet paper and water, apparently the only thing left on the shelves was Dasani. Uh, I'm not sure why. If it, makes you feel better, you can pretend it's Avion or something like that. Uh, so maybe a bad uh, graphic, but nonetheless, for comparison, what's the moisture level we're talking about here? We're talking about a moisture level that is 100 times drier than the Sahara Desert. Okay, so the next question is, where exactly is this water and how did it get there? So given the measured abundance level, we believe that the water may have been created by the constant bombardment of the moon by micrometeors. The water would be created by the impacts and become trapped in so-called impact glasses, which are created by the heat of these meteors impacting the lunar surface. Now, given the fact that the lunar soil is believed to consist of almost 30% impact glass, the amount of water we've detected at six microns is consistent with the amount of water we would expect to be produced from micrometeorite impacts. So the SOFIA observations have shown that the moon may be wetter than than we once thought. But if the water that we're finding is in a form that could ever be exploitable by human settlers on the moon. And that means for now, NASA's return mission to the moon will have to leave enough storage space in their capsules for those bottles of Dasani. So with that, I, I want to thank you for your time. And I once again want to draw your attention to the presently open call for archival research funding and the related webinar tomorrow, as well as uh, show you, uh, tell you about the two sessions I'll remind you about the two sessions, one held this morning to discuss specific Sophia legacy data that should be available for download tomorrow, and the other being held in about an hour from now to discuss stellar feedback. And thank you, I'll take questions.